Hey everybody, this is Carlos. Thanks for joining us. On today's show, we're going to be speaking with one of my favorite people in the boa industry, Chaz Shillings of Loki Boas. Chaz is arguably one of the best boa breeders in America. He is focusing on many cutting-edge projects including the Demon, Specker, and various VPI projects. We're going to talk about how he got involved in the boa game and his plans for the upcoming season. We're also going to talk about his time in the NFL, and he's going to give us a breakdown of the black-eyed anery gene. Finally, we're going to talk about the importance of selecting the right animals to improve your collection. Boa Rack Radio is on the air now! Welcome everybody to Boa Rack Radio. I'm your host, Carlos Rojas from Wolf's Unleashed. Our guest today is one of my good friends, Chaz Schillens. He's based out of Arizona. He's uh, well known for his cutting edge work with many boa morphs. And he's also the proprietor of low-key boas. Uh, But more importantly, he is one of the guys that tends to produce some of the best examples of all the projects he works with. For those that don't know, Chaz is a former football player. And uh, he's probably one of the nicest guys in the industry. Chaz, welcome to the show, my brother. Hey, Carlos. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. So let's talk a little bit about your background and how you got involved with reptiles and then eventually how that led you into boas. Um, well, my background is um, I used to live in Northern California. And as a kid just growing up, I used to go out and, you know, in nature and just catch anything I could, man. Catch lizards, uh, snakes, anything, anything I get my hands on, man. And uh, pretty much my parents would never let me keep anything. You know, I'd catch i'd find cool gopher snakes king snakes whatnot but um my parents really never let me keep anything you know reptile related so i always wanted a reptile always wanted a reptile and uh you kind of fast forward that to uh high school i i I moved out to arizona um i was lucky enough to know uh to go to into a a, a nice uh, pet shop out here in uh gilbert owned by uh christian it was called predators Oh yeah, and that's yeah. That's it's really when I saw my first. Um, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure you got him from Rich Eiley, but I saw my first salmon boa, like probably in like 2001. Right. And and after that, I was like completely hooked. Like I just I, I loved boa constrictors. I've, I've had a few other species, but I saw my first uh, salmon boa. My parents still didn't let me get it, but <laughs> I just remember being in love with it. It was just red and clean, and uh, it was just it was just awesome. But uh, after that, you know, I went to I went to college out in San Diego. I went to San Diego State, and San Diego, I'm lucky, has some really good reptile shows. And uh, I met uh, in 2003. I met Big Mike from Basically Boas, and uh, I bought my first uh, my first boa morph, a peachy orange tail hypo, from him. And uh, one of the best days of my life. It was great, and <laughs> established established a relationship with him, man. So. Uh, you know, ever since then, that was that was it for me. You know, that that was pretty much how I got into boas. Was I had to go off to college? You know, I remember I bought my first boa with a stipend check that I got from my scholarship. Right. <laughs> and uh, you know, my parents weren't there. I could my roommates had to put up with it, and uh, it was what it was. Right. So at that time, you were obviously playing ball in college, dude. So mm-hmm. what happened when you would have to travel for like away games? Did your roommates hook you up and take care of the boa, or kind of keep an eye on it for you? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, but for the most part. <laughs> for the most part i would just have to our, our, our trips were short they were only two three days at the most but right. uh yeah usually if someone was staying behind they check on it for me or you know make sure the temps were good and everything but uh man it was it was crazy some a couple of guys i lived with they loved it they thought it was cool a couple other guys i lived with they were like yeah whatever but i will tell you everybody loved to uh you know watch them eat oh yeah do all that stuff you know take them out let watch me handle them so that was always cool it was always kind of like the life of the party because everyone wanted to just everybody loves snakes you know i feel yeah, like yeah, people totally. are just kind of people are kind of just like mystified by them yeah no for sure man so tell me about a couple of things that you're passionate uh, about outside of you know snakes uh in general um well mainly mainly i uh well i work for the phoenix fire department so i love my job um i love being a firefighter i'm passionate about that i have uh three little girls um I have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a four-year-old, so I'm passionate about them. They take up, they demand quite a bit of time, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. But other than that, man, I'm I'm into a little bit of woodworking, a little bit of gardening, and um, recently I've taken up rowing, like uh, on the concept row machine, whatever okay. you call it, and uh, I enjoy that. I'm pretty decent at it and working my way, working my way up. But I really like that, man, and I 
a little bit of everything, man. I run a little bit. I did a marathon. I've tried to uh, branch out and stay active, but that's that's the main stuff for me. Awesome, man. So let me ask you, what made you go from like a hobby collection into uh, a breeding collection when you uh, kind of made that switch? Because I know you still consider yourself like a hobbyist in a lot of ways. Yeah. But obviously, to a lot of people, uh, from the outside, you're viewed as one of the uh, better boa breeders out there. So kind of when did you decide to make this into an unofficial business per se? Well, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself a great boa breeder, but I try. Oh, get but, out uh, of here, dude. <laughs> but um, honestly, no, I'm not. There's, there's way better guys than me. But I'll be honest, I got into a, from a collection to a hobby. I would say it really all has to do a lot with um, when I met Big Mike in 2003. Like when I went to the show and I saw the quality of like his boa constrictors, you know, previously before that, all I'd ever seen was pretty much online you know, on Jeff Ronnie's website or, right. um, or King snake or the red tail bow forums. But when I saw his stuff in person, man, I was like, this is, this is awesome. Um, I would, to, to answer that question, I would say a little bit was like time and space. So while I was in college, I just couldn't have a, a very large collection. I only, I only ever had like six or seven bow constrictors while I was in college. Um, and then while I moved, when I, when I played in the NFL, I, I, uh, I got quite a bit more, but it, it was never what I'd consider as a lot. I got, I think I had 30 or 40, but it was just, what would my life allow? You know, college, yeah. I didn't, didn't have an, a lot of money and I didn't have a lot of space or time. And then the same with, with when I was playing ball, ball like, um, I just couldn't have a hundred, 200, 300 snakes. Um, even though I, I wanted to, I, I, I didn't have the space or time for it, but really after I was done playing football and now then I was able to kind of take a step back, refocus, um, acquire more animals, hold back more animals. So, um, meeting big Mike though was, was the first thing I would say. And then just as time went along, obviously football too allowed me to buy, buy more animals, buy nicer animals. So, um, I was lucky in that regard. Yeah, totally, man. So, um, how did low key boas come around? Like, where'd you get the name? What kind of inspired that? Um, that's maybe, a. oh, let's see. It, I'd say it started in 2009. Um, when I was, I was living in the Bay Area. I was playing football, and uh, I became friends with Tony Green. I don't, I don't know if how many people know about him. Oh, he's old school, man. <laughs> yeah, he's he's old school. So yeah, I, I met him in '09. Um, I drove down to LA in the off season to uh, just meet him, see his collection, because I was just a fan of the few bows that I saw. And man, when I saw his snakes, I was just like flabbergasted. I was just like, I couldn't believe that someone had this nice of snakes. And uh, to be honest, he was the nicest guy I've ever met. He was humble. He was nice. He was honest, sincere. And uh, he just loved, like, quality boas. So um, it was just crazy to me when I thought, okay, this guy's low-key, but he no one knows about him, really. Right. really. I mean, he, he posts, like, one picture and then never posts a picture for six months a year. But it'd be, like, the best anything you've ever seen. And this was back in 2009 when, like, Pink Panthers were ten grand, Like, right. VPI Motley's were, like, over 10 grand like stuff was triple heads were triple head snow glows were rare incredibly rare and he had you know he just had everything that you could possibly dream of so that's for me like the beginning of it it, it was really him he had a huge influence on me um i definitely wanted to emulate like a guy that's incredibly nice a guy that has killer snakes and kind of is just on the in the shadows in the shadows and then i would say uh Later, when I started getting involved on social media and the forums, you know, like I was telling you, like Reptile Insider or, or um, well, back in the day, it was uh, Red Tail Boas, too. Um, yeah, Red Tail Boas. Ronnie's forum. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I really just, I, I'm, not, I'm not the greatest speaker, I'd say, and, uh, you know, I'm not good at writing or whatever. So I really just enjoy taking nice pictures, and I kind of just let my pictures speak for themselves. So I'd consider that another, you know, another process of becoming low-key boas and then when i made my i made a facebook page i don't know four or five years ago that's when i was like i think i'm just gonna make it this and run with it and uh you know that's kind of how how it came about pretty much yeah no that's cool man i was gonna say another thing about how loki's boas, okay yeah how, how low-key boas came about was pretty much um which is a good topic to talk about, talk about i think is pretty much just i i use it now as a force of habit like do i want to be on social media yeah. Do I want to have a fancy website? Do I want to be out there more and do the shows? Yes, I do. But for me and my life, what works best is I have a busy life, you know, for, for me to create balance between my job, 
my hobby slash business and my personal life. Um, that's kind of what I've chosen to do because I have a lot of things that I, I said. I said I have my daughters. Right. Um, I still like to work out hard and train hard. I like to take care of my snakes. So what I learned from social media is that it is a good tool that for me myself, take what I say with a grain of salt. But a lot of times it was it was a distraction for me. I was, I spend a, a, an ordinate amount of time on there answering window shoppers and talking to random people that I thought were my friends that maybe weren't my friends. And uh, so now I kind of just use it as a buffer, you know, like I yeah. feel like I feel like I have a good balance between my caring for my snakes, my social life, my job and everything. And uh, now I, I just enjoy I enjoy not having I know I'm probably on the I'm probably the norm, but I feel like it was pretty important to say that you don't have to be on social media to be a good boa breeder. I sell plenty of snakes. I feel like I'm semi successful. So, um, you know, there's different avenues to have success is what I was going to say. Yeah, totally, man. So um, tell me about uh, some of the people that inspired you and kind of mentored you uh, throughout this process. So Big Mike from Basically Boas, 100%. He was pretty much a catalyst for everything. Um, I have the utmost respect for him. Uh, um, he's still a good friend. Um, Tony, uh, Green Ant. Um, Kyle Frost, I would say. And Tracy Barker, Dave and Tracy. Absolutely. I would say those were pretty much my mentors. You know, people people that I looked up to a lot, people I respect how they did business. I respected the quality of their animals. Um, but to be honest, uh, I, I look up to a, a lot of people that probably don't even have a clue. There's a, there's a lot of people out there that inspire me that they may not be mentors, but I look up to them and how they operate and the animals they have. And, uh, you know, I feel like you can learn from anyone, to be honest. Absolutely, man. So let's uh, chat a little bit about your kind of life as a pro football player and, you know, being a bro breeder while you were doing that. So mm -hmm. many people assume because you were a professional athlete that you didn't earn your place in this hobby. You know, they think that um, a lot of professional athletes just have a lot of money access to them and they can pay other people to take care of their collections <laughs> and things of that nature. Right. But you know, yeah. having a lot of friends who are professional athletes, um, mostly kind of in the MLB kind of side of the house, I know this mm -hmm. couldn't be further from the truth, right? The amount yeah. of work that's associated with getting in the league and obviously staying there, right. While keeping in a collection is absolutely daunting, dude. It, it just absolutely blows my mind. Right. Yeah. And I know how hard you've had to grind to basically make your collection where it currently is. So what was it like keeping a collection while you were making such a large uh, time commitment outside uh, of, you know, Boas itself? Um, dude, it was, well, my experience is it was, it was daunting. It was absolutely terrible. It was absolutely, it was, it was difficult. I always felt like I was compromising with, um, moving around a lot, not, right. be, not having the most stable life. And you, you are right. You, you touched on it. Um, that was my whole life playing football. What was my life? Because I was always a guy on the bottom of the roster. I was never a star. I never had a huge contract. So every day I showed up to work, I was legit legitimately thinking to myself, like if I don't perform today and do my job, they could get rid of me. So everything I pretty much did during the season, during the off season, my number one priority was my job, my family, and then and then snakes. So I moved around a lot. Um, I didn't have a lot of stability, like I said. It was just it was very very difficult, very very difficult to uh, to pull off. And I and I try. I I hear what you said. You know, people think you can hire anyone, do whatever you want. I, I tried. I tried a couple different times to hire different people, um, but unless you're I often found that unless you do it yourself, it's not going to get it's not going to get done right. And I just it was it was difficult. So that's so, my experience. Yeah, man. So while you were keeping them during that kind of period in your life, was your collection uh, like a source of enjoyment, a source of stress, or both? Oh, it was definitely a it was a huge source of enjoyment. It was kind of my little getaway from the stress of football, the stress of performing. Um, I thought about it a lot. It was always in the back of my mind, and um, but I kind of had to do what I needed to do to be able to play football for as long as I could and perform. But yeah, man, it, it was the little, the little downtime that I did get. I would, I, I, I absolutely loved cleaning my boys. I enjoyed them. I still talked to all the same people. I just wasn't able to, uh, I wasn't able to develop my projects the way I wanted to. And I wasn't able to, I was, I wasn't able to have that stable foundation and stay in one place for four or five years at a time. Like some, some professional athletes do. So, you know, my, my experience was just a little different. But uh, I enjoyed it. I always loved the boas. I always loved the boas. It afforded me a means and a life that I that I never would have had otherwise. And I 
feel lucky to be able to have the snakes that I have, especially from playing football. So, so let me ask you, what lessons from professional sports um, have you kind of brought into the reptile hobby? Um, a lot, man. Shoot, uh, a couple things: attention to detail, um, having a plan, trying to execute that plan. You know, like during the breeding season, um, dealing with failure. That's oh, yeah. a big thing. Oh yeah, dealing with failure. Football, you know. Football is a lot of failure, man. A lot of failure, a lot of heartache, a lot of physical physical hurting. And uh, I feel like that applies to boas more than anything, man. If you, I think anyone that's had boas for any amount of time, if you haven't dealt with failure, you probably, you probably have let, just left the hobby. Because if yeah. you can't deal with it a little bit, then you're just not cut out for it. Um, but um, adapting to situations, you know, places you live, caging, um, everything. Never giving up. That's another, that's another thing. I never felt like I gave up in football and there's been times where bows have been so frustrating that I've just been like, man, it's difficult, but, uh, I'm still here. I'm still around. Um, it's, it's, I'm still more than happy to have snakes and I absolutely love, I absolutely love boas. So those dude, are some things I've learned. Dude, I'm with you on that one. So, uh, we just had, uh, uh, a young uh, up and coming boa breeder on the show a little bit while ago and one of the things that we were talking about is the fact that if the, what distinguishes people who manage to stick around the boa game long enough is essentially how they adapt to that failure right because the failure yeah. is going to happen the heartache is going to happen and we were yeah. talking about the fact that like um, uh, for example like uh, two years ago I ended up getting this huge huge uh, uh, female uh, yellow panther right and mm -hmm. she was massive, dude. And I brought her to uh, IMG, uh, yeah. DPI, right? That was also yeah. uh, head annery. And oh, nice. uh, they bred. Everything was looking so fantastic, dude. And then two weeks before she was due, she died. And oh. I cut her open, dude. There was like 13 IMG snows inside oh. of her, man. So, I mean, yeah. Like, and, I think, and I think she had a total of like 49 babies in her. So, yeah. I mean, like, there's always moments like that. If If you can't get through those moments, dude, you know. You're not yeah. going to stick around. And the reality is most of us will have a situation like that happen or a couple happen a couple of times, depending how long you're in the game. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a, I think every one of us has gone through a situation where you're like, forget this, dude. I, I don't want to deal with this. And you're maybe down in the dumps for, you know, a week or two. And then you you realize, hey, you know, still got to take care of the, the ones that are still around. And yeah, little man. by little, you, you, get, you, get, you get out of uh, out of that depression slowly. Yeah, man. My heart goes out to you. My, my heart absolutely goes out to you because that is absolutely heartbreaking, man. It crushes it crushes your spirit, man. Because oh, you does, work on man. something you work on something for three, four, five years. You know, you have an idea in mind, you have to formulate a plan, and then you see it happen before your eyes and to be that close, man. I mean, that's that's kind of the same story early on that I had some bad stuff go on, but I realized I talked to my, my friends and I'd be like, like I can't believe this, man. This is the worst day ever. And they tell me, oh, they just had something similar. And then oh, I yeah. talked to another friend and they said, oh, well, I just had this happen. And I realized everybody has bad stuff. It's not just me. And that's true in life in general, but everybody has horrible stuff that happens completely out of the blue. Sometimes, sometimes self-inflicted, sometimes out of the blue, but it's really just, and I'll be honest, man, I don't, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be dead honest with you the whole time, but the I've come really close a couple times just being like, that's it. I've had enough, but absolutely, man. I just, I, I love, I genuinely love the snakes that I have and the projects that I'm working on so much that I just be like, it would kill me to not be able to see those around or not to be able to see it all the way out. So I, I just, I just have kind of just stuck it out. It's definitely a war of attrition though. It's definitely a war of attrition. Cause if you can't deal with situations like what you just said, you, you just won't last, man. You got, you have to be incredibly tough. <laughs> yeah, man, and I think uh, a lot of that kind of speaks maybe to uh, to your athletic background. And I've likened it when I was talking to Dave Schmidt, who you've met before, my buddy who's a, mm -hmm. a, a force recon sniper. You know, we we deal with similar stuff that guys in pro sports deal with, in the fact that you know, getting to the top tier of any profession really requires an inordinate amount of work, right? And yeah. what happens when you work your ass off and you face an injury, right? Yeah, something that's yeah. almost outside of your control. And a lot yeah. of times, you know, that's what ends up separating guys that, you know, um, simply uh, don't have that mentality to get to the top tier levels, right? And I'm sure when you were playing football coming up through the years, you knew plenty of guys that probably suffered injuries that may not necessarily have been career ending, but they made a conscious choice to end whatever their dream was because essentially 
I don't want to necessarily say they yeah, didn't want it bad enough, but you know, they didn't want it bad enough, right? Yeah, so. you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. In college and in NFL, I saw both. Life is about failure, man. And if you, it is. I, I, I do feel like I was lucky through college and, and playing football that I dealt with so much failure and injuries, exactly like what you pointed out to that if I can overcome, you know, knee surgeries and rehab multiple times over and some of the things I had to go through that, you know, at the end of the day, if I lose a, a quality expensive snake or a project doesn't go the way I want it to go, is it heartbreaking? Yeah. But absolutely, you know what? It's not the end of the world. I can deal with it. I can maybe shift my, if anything, maybe it'll give me an opportunity to focus on something else. But at the end of the day, I still have my family. I still have my overall health and I still have great snakes. So if you can't deal with failure, man, it, it's just, it's, it's just not the, it's not the hobby for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the, the projects that you're currently working on. What's your, what will you feel is your primary focus at the current moment project wise? Um, a couple things. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, man. Ever since I saw the first jungle boa, I think it was like 2003. First, I, I've, I've loved jungles. I've loved every type of jungle, every line of jungle I've ever seen. I just love, I love the morph. Um, so early on, that's what I went hard on. And actually still now yeah. I do pretty much almost every, I've actually worked myself into a corner sometimes because almost every snake I have does have jungle. So yeah, I think every snake I've during... ever gotten off of you has jungle in it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I, it's dumb, but I'll hold back stuff that, that, that has jungle that I, that I don't need. And then I can't do certain breedings down the road. But that being said, uh, I've loved jungles for 17 years, like I was saying, but man, I, I do love labyrinths a ton. Like I, I've, it, it kind of takes the cake to be honest with you even more in jungle. Cause just the variety of pattern, the variety of looks, how strong it is, how it affects other codoms, um, the effect it has like on Motley, Key West, other stuff. I just, I've never seen anything like it. And then when you talk about the crystal, like, oh yeah, it's pretty much just a uh, game over. That's like, for me, the best thing I've ever seen. So um, I love it. I, I love the labyrinth. I, I wish I had more. Um, but stuff that I'm focusing on now, like I said, is jungle, labyrinths. Um, pretty much my how I function was I tend to be all over the place and not focus too much. So I realized a couple years ago that I had to specifically, specifically focus on stuff. So for me, I'm, I'm working on the VPI, obviously, um, the black eyed Annery, uh, stuff from Kenny Saito, the RDR, um, RDR stuff, blood, and then, um, just working all the combos I can into it, you know, four or five, six genes combos into, um, all those recessives. So, that's pretty much and, and a little bit of call and, and leopard stuff, but I'm probably behind on some of that stuff. But those are pretty much my primary focuses for now. Awesome, man. So let's talk a little bit about the VPI work that you're currently doing. I know you're doing a lot of snows and VPI combos. What are some of the stuff mm -hmm. that you're hoping to produce this year that you know you're looking forward to? Um, well, specifically the v VPI stuff. Um, I guess the, the specter kind of does fall underneath that. It's right. a RD, it's a RDR VPI snow. So um, I was lucky I, I produced another one of those this year. I'm still doing it's been it's been a long road because I'm still doing head to heads. So um, and I'm also working on outcrossing. But um, I, I was lucky, man. A couple years ago, I, I made some some snow glow jungles, some snow glow Key West, some snow key, some snow motleys, and then the year before that, I made some IMG snow. Um, IMG snow jungle motley stuff and whatnot. So I'm working my way there, but this year I might not actually make any visual VPI snow glow stuff specifically. Huh. I, I, uh, I was, I, I had the litter of the specter stuff and, uh, all my really, really crazy pairings of VPI snow glow stuff. It, uh, it's been a little slow. I can't, I can't explain it. It just is what it is. And meanwhile, other stuff that, that there was maybe my, not my primary focus did really well. So just a different year. I don't, I don't know. I can't yeah. explain it. Yeah, dude, I can. It's called boa breathing, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your blood projects. I know you're uh, throwing uh, Annery into blood and into the call stuff. So mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about what you're uh, working with blood wise. Yeah. Uh, so last year I was able to make those, uh, well, actually, yeah, last year, 2019, I was able to make those, um, type one Annery bloods. Um, I call them demons. Right. Um, I've actually heard that 
people were questioning why I called him that. And pretty much, you know, like my reasoning behind it wasn't that I was just itching to use a, a name or make something up. It really was just that I, when I saw them, they're, they're completely different from a uh, pewter or right. a ghost a pewter. Uh, yeah. yeah, plasma. It's they're, they're, they're not, they're not in the same. They just look different. They look completely different to me. And as they, as they've aged, I think it's appropriate. I, I, I feel like it deserves some, a name for being something different, but um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely focused on that because it kind of, when they came out, they kind of exceeded my expectations. So um, I think the, the, the sky is the limit on that project. And then I'm also working on the call blood stuff. Like a lot of their people are trying to breed it into jungle motley and key West and um, some other stuff, but it's just a long road. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit behind on that too, probably, but um yeah, man. I'm, right now, I'd say my, my favorite blood project is is the is the Type One Annery. So, because I've been successful with it, and I like the way they look. So, <laughs> yeah, dude, for sure, dude. So, let's talk about a little bit about what you're doing uh, labby wise. Uh, anything uh, fun that you're throwing labby at right now? Um, just I had a really nice hypo jungle labyrinth that I bred a uh, really really nice. Um, to I bred him to a really nice Pink Panther VPI that was pretty sure is het bea from kenny saito right. so she's due uh in a couple of weeks and uh i just hope to make some of my own stock and uh of of labyrinth stuff and that's pretty much been my only uh my only success up until this point man it's been a long road i didn't i've had some uh unfortunate stuff happen with some of the other labyrinth stuff i have but uh it's uh i'm looking forward to that man i think it's a great gene and uh just to make some nice have vpis for myself because i have so many other vpi jeans hanging around it would be nice so i can definitely use it i know other people are far ahead sergio and thomas cobb and tony antonucci so my hat's off to them man maybe someday uh soon i can maybe buy buy some some other labyrinth jeans from them so oh, yeah no totally man um so are there any other projects that you're seeing out in the hobby uh, right now that kind of have you excited that you're uh, seeing that they could potentially have some untapped potential Man, I feel like there's potential everywhere. Um, absolutely. Um, let me think. Let me think a little bit. I've seen a, lo a lot of nice blood stuff out there lately, to be honest with you. And I remember back in the day, blood stuff just didn't used to look that good. But now it seems like everybody's producing quality bloods. And then mixing it into the VPIs, mix it into anneries. I know people are working on. Um, I also see a, a lot of nice leopards. I feel like leopards were kind of like pretty underrated for a long time and maybe a lot of people weren't focusing on them i feel like there was also a stigma i don't know you could tell me but i feel like maybe 10 years ago if you if someone were to breed a leopard in a vpi they'd be like oh don't do that like oh, why yeah, would you do that absolutely yeah. dude. oh yeah it dude. was i was even on I, I i i guess i never i didn't do the breeding but i remember people thinking about it and i remember like yeah no one no one's doing it they were all everyone was focused on making visuals I, I, or making pink panthers well, you know what? I think a lot of people just simply frowned on, you know, bringing in Central American morphs into yeah. like Colombian morphs, right? And yeah. I think that was a lot of people kind of poo-pooed it, but I think as um, as time has gone by, you're seeing the potential of some of the stuff that's being produced. Like for example, I don't know if you got to see like uh, the uh, the habanero boa that got produced yeah. uh, last year, right? Yeah. Where you where you have, you know, a, a visual VPI leopard and essentially yeah. what that could do. So I mean I think people yeah. are kind of waking up to it little by little. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it takes seeing that final end result to kind of keep people in gear. But I definitely remember for the longest time when I first got into Boas and then even five, ten years ago, like people didn't want to breed leopard into VPI. People didn't want to breed blood into VPI. And now you kind of see the end result with like some bloody salmon stuff that Sergio made and some other stuff that's been made with the habanero stuff you just talked about. Like it's, it's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing. And, uh, it's a good project, man. I think those are some of the best stuff. I definitely have some different ideas about avenues to kind of take that. But, uh, um, I definitely have some ideas, man, but, but, uh, I don't know. I'd love to hear your ideas. I mean, like, where do you think? Well, I'm, 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 that's, well, let me put it this way. I'm watching a, a VPI Sunglow Jungle Head Annery breeding a leopard right now. So, <laughs> absolutely, that, that's yeah. kind of where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? A a absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and another thing, I think I could touch on is not that's God. I, I'm a little jealous of that breeding. I would love to. I don't have that much leopard stock, and that's another thing where I'm just talking about. Like, I kind of shot myself in the foot keeping all these jungles and all this other stuff, and I should have, meanwhile, been raising up ten leopard females, but. 
It's all right. I'm catching up. It well, is you know, what it is. You know what's crazy about that is all those people that essentially kind of poo-pooed the mixing of the Central American into the Colombian stuff now are in a position where they're having to play catch up and there's guys that yeah. were doing it early on. Like for example, a big one is like Richard Del Bono, right? Over at Da Vinci yeah. Boas. He's been mixing stuff, you know, for a while and his whole thing has been like, dude, I like how this particular morph looks and I don't really care what other people say because I think it's going to look yeah. great with this other particular morph. And for a while he was getting a lot of hate from a lot of people and now he's producing some crazy looking snakes. Yeah. And you can't argue with the end up. result. Exactly. Yeah, you, man. you can't argue with the end result. And sometimes it takes someone being a little crazy and thinking outside the box, man, like be a pioneer of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I a hundred percent agree. I a hundred percent agree. So give me some important lessons that you learned setting up this hobby uh, and converting it into a business. What are some of the things that you would kind of advise other people when they're moving from a pure hobby collection and they maybe want to produce a couple of snakes to cover their, their rap bill, for example? Um, a couple of things. A couple of things just from my experience is um, invest in quality cages. Uh, yeah. that, that's, that's the first thing I would say. It, I know it's hard to do. It's hard to it's hard to set aside a chunk of money when you're beginning and you see, you want to get all these snakes and say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to buy the nicest cages I can. But looking back on it, just my experience, I originally started with, um, well, I, I don't even need to say it, but I, I won't even say the company's names, but I've, I've gone through four iterations of cages and now I've been doing this for 17 years now. I feel like I'm finally very, very happy with the cages I ended up with. Yep. But not to say that the other cages were bad, but specifically how I keep my snakes and where I live at, these are what work best for me. And, and that's something you have to take into account. You have to take account, where do I live at? Do you keep your snakes inside? Do you keep them outside? Are you in a basement? You know, like, do they, you know, like, specifically, like you said, I live in Arizona. It's hotter than hell out here. And I choose to keep my snakes in a separate room in my garage. So um, how I keep them, the cages I'm happy with now, um, yeah, that's where I'm at. But everyone's different. Everyone's different. Um, give some serious thought about what project you want to get into. Um, and what specifically what breeder you want to buy from. And then I would say ask around a little bit um, before you buy from a breeder. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt um, just to get a couple references. And another thing to touch on it that you've touched in your previous podcast is it, it doesn't have to be from a big breeder. You know, like um, some of the best snakes I've ever bought have been from guys I had no clue about. I just messaged and uh, or I drove up and met and uh, I, I couldn't have been happier. You don't have to buy snakes from a big breeder or a big name. It definitely helps with name recognition, but uh, I would just say it, 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 you feel free to go out there and buy snakes from, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the little guy. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't know. Um, some other stuff is um, buy from someone you admire, not only their boas, but, you know, the way they treat people, their customer service, and you know the ex ethics of how they run their business, which right. there are plenty, of, plenty of great guys out there that have great customer service, that treat people the good way, that sell great snakes. So um, be mindful of all that stuff, man. Starting out because it, it's difficult when you don't know what you know. You, you don't know what you don't know when you're starting out. You know, like you don't know. And if you're just kind of getting all your information from one person, and that person maybe isn't the right person, they can kind of lead you astray. And I hate to say it, but it, 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 it happens. It happens sometimes. So um, just ask around, man. Ask your friends. And then I guess I kind of contradicted myself. But also, <laughs> also get some references, but don't be afraid to buy from a small breeder. Because like I said, man, when I was Spartan, out, I, I'll still buy from a small breeder. I don't, I don't care at all. Because they, everyone makes great snakes, especially in 2020, man. Everybody has the ability to make great snakes, man. Like it's it's crazy the amount of quality that's out there compared to when I was first starting out. It's right. it's it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. So where do you see the future of the hobby going? Um, man, I, I feel like the future is brighter than ever. Um, like I was just saying, I can remember back in the early two thousands when I started getting into it. It nice animals were out there, but it was just they were a lot more rare to see a nice quality motley. I remember Chris Nicholas used to make like the best motleys out there. And if you wanted a nice motley, you'd have to go from him. It, but to see like a high end jungle, like in 2003, I remember if you wanted to see like a, if you wanted to buy a fully striped jungle, like they, a crazy aberrant jungle, they, they, they were crazy hard to get a hold of. And they costed a ton, like costed a lot. You, you couldn't get them. Now you can get, <laughs> you can yeah. get anything you want, man. Like, and you can get in any color, any recessive attached, like, it's out there. You might have yep. to pay still a little bit more. Especially for it, with but... the advent of Morph Market. You know what I mean? Oh, oh, 
Oh yeah. Yeah. It's helped out a lot. Like you definitely didn't have that tool back then. Facebook wasn't around or wasn't utilized the way it was now or Instagram, but it's, it, that's, that's perhaps maybe the, the most positive thing I can think of is that just the quality of what's out there now compared to even when I was starting and I haven't even been around as, as long as some of these other people. Um, but the future of the hobby, um, yeah, Morph Market, you touched on it. It's been a great tool. Um, there's just so many breeders out there. I went, went, you know, 10 years ago, I felt like the boa community was still even a little bit smaller when, when I was on um, Reptile Insider and right. the forums and King Snake. Um, I just felt like it was a smaller community. Now I feel like when you go on Morph Market and you see, you can look up the number of breeders, you can see what they've sold, you can see everything. It kind of says like, wow, there's a lot of people out there that are kind of sharing, sharing the dream, you know? It's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So specifically for me, I feel like uh, the future is a couple different things. Um, number one thing is quality. I, I really, I really believe that uh, we're getting to the point soon where if you're not producing like legit holdbacks or high, high level quality in all your breedings that you're going to have a difficult time selling stuff because there's so much high quality out there and there's so much variety now. Um, and then kind of the next thing off of that is that if you're not working with, with, with double recesses or working your, your way towards triple or quad recessives that, that, you know, those snakes that are legitimately hard to make the, your VPI snow glows, your VPI bloods that I feel like that's where the future is going because it's so hard to make the, it's going to drive, it's going to cause the prices to remain high for a very long period of time. When you're looking at a chance, a snake that you only have a one in 64 to make or a one in 196 chance to make, um, that's kind of where I, I believe it's at. Uh, snakes that are hard to make snakes that are extremely, extremely high quality. And then, um, as far as specific genes, I think the future for me, and you can take what I say with a grain of salt because everyone's different. Right. But specifically, I, I do think that the labyrinth and then the, uh, the carbon stuff that Kenny's working on, maybe some uh, the specter stuff that I'm working on and Big Mike's working on, and then the fire and then the blood stuff specifically for me, the, the, the demon stuff is I, – I, I firmly believe that's the future because you're talking about – a powerful, powerful codom like a labyrinth. And then if you can mix that into all these recessives and double recessive stuff, then that's the future is bright, man. I mean, I, it, let me, let me throw some stuff out there to you. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think a crystal demon would look like? Oh, I a crystal. No, so I think a, it would be like a, I, I honestly like a red snake with like a pinkish hue. If that makes any damn sense yeah. to you. Almost yeah. purplish. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the stuff that I dream about. Think about this: what would a what would a VPI bloody snow look like? Everybody, nobody knows what a v, what a what a VPI blood looks like. Bloody salmon yeah. looks like like it, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. But imagine if you can mix in some anery into that. Yeah. What about what about this? Because I've I've listened to your few podcasts, and I feel like somebody, few people have kind of touched on it, but the fire gene. Yeah, I've heard a few people say that the fire is super underrated, and I absolutely. I do understand. I do understand. I mean, super. Yeah. But what do you think if you could get, so not all fires, super fires, I mean, are, are pure white. They're not. Right, right. Jeremy's made a lot of them that are very speckled, especially from the central blood. But let me I ask always, you this. Always, is that a bad thing? Is that necessarily a bad no. thing? Because like, if you look, you know what a palmetto corn snake is? Where you have Absolutely. like a, a white snake that's speckled with kind of a rainbow of colors. That would not Absolutely. be a bad thing. I think that'd be badass. That's exactly where I'm going, Carlos. I was going to say, what would a, so imagine if we could play that up even more and get it to the point, like, what would an IMG Superfire look like? What if you could get Ooh. some of those, what, what if you could get some of those black speckling to show back up? Kind of like a, uh, you know, Tracy Barker's Magpies? Yeah, absolutely. Magpie Bloods? Yeah. What if you could get some of that, like, that, that paradox or I don't know the exact word I'm looking for, but what if you could get, what if you could play up those speckles in a genetically inheritable trait yeah. so that way. So when you could tell someone I'm, I'm not making pure white snakes, like I'm making, you know, almost like a matrix a, type blood. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. What about, what about a call snow dragon? Woo. Who the what hell about knows if, what that would look like? Whoa. Yeah. I'm working, I'm working on that. What if, what if you could get, what if you could get a leopard? What if you could get the leopard, the blood, and the anery or the albino gene together. Like, I'm pretty sure people are working on it, but like, oh, that's yeah. the type of stuff. That's the type of stuff I say. Like, futures, the future's super bright, man. Now, with the quality, 
the quality and variety of genes guys have to work with, and especially more and more receptors get in there, man, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. Like, I, I've never been more excited to see, especially what other people do. Like, I, I'm pretty excited about what I do, and I, I'm looking forward to it. But I, I love to see what other people do, man. And sometimes someone makes something that I wasn't even thinking about. It kind of readjusts like your expectations and makes you think like, how could I do that? Or yeah. how could I? And, and, and honestly, I think one thing that we're going to end up seeing more in the future is the resurgence of genes and maybe in different pastel lines that we have, you know, potentially forgotten. So, for example, Absolutely. you measured like you, you, you mentioned the peachy line stuff that Big Mike produced, right? And Absolutely. The, and I remember some of the, in my opinion, the peachy line jungles that Mike, Big Mike was producing back in 03 was probably some of the best jungles that i've ever seen right absolutely they were so, the best so when, when are we going to get like you know a resurgence of those when is somebody that's secretly keeping a little bit of peachy line stuff in their collection all of a sudden going to yeah. mix it with the right combo and it's going to yeah. blow people's freaking socks off you know yeah yeah you're absolutely right you're, you're absolutely right i would love to see the resurgence of some of the some of the other bloodlines or some even morphs that there's a couple of codons out there that like nobody talks about and maybe they do a little bit more in europe but I mean, we could bring it up, but I'm always perplexed. Like, I've had some Celtic stuff, and I've read it to some stuff, and I've seen the way Celtics – Celtics are great. Like, if you're talking about a Motley, I've always loved Motleys. But for the right. most part, unless you're getting, like, an RC Motley, you're getting a Motley with a dark tail. Like, Correct. what about a Motley – I always wanted, like, Motleys with pure red tails. Celtics have incredibly connected thick patterns, and almost all of their babies, are their tails are pure, pure red. Like even I, I'm a huge proponent of Key West gene. Almost everything yeah, I have absolutely. is Key West. Key West. I love Key West. But to be honest, a Celtic is 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 maybe even better. And I feel like I go on Morph Mark and I see like six Kel six Celtics are for sale. No one even no one even works on them. Meanwhile, yeah, they, over here, I'm trying to work them. They're into sleeping everything. on them, man. They're sleeping yeah. on them, dude. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I'll th I'll throw this out there. I I've never I've only told a few people this, but um. A couple of years ago, I bred Celtic to a Key West, and it was one of the. It's one of the most phenomenal morphs I've ever made. It 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 almost looks like a super. It almost looks like a super Key West, but it's it's not. It's not at all. It's it's truly truly unbelievable. And and I think if more people started, like you're saying, mixing some of these lesser known ingredients together and stuff, projects that kind of aren't even being touched, like you would see some incredible results, like incredible results. And that's where I wonder, like, when are people? You got to branch out and create something for yourself, and I look forward to seeing what people can do, man. Hopefully, uh, I don't know. Maybe I inspire people to do something different because there's great stuff out there that hasn't even been touched yet. Yeah, dude, and, and, and I honestly feel that that's one of the things that people are forgetting. Obviously, it's cool to uh, chase some of the morphs that are popular right now in the hobby, but yeah. I think one of the things that maybe has set you apart is the fact that you're not shy about mixing various recessives to see just what the hell is going to happen. You yeah, know what I mean. And I think that's probably speaks to a lot, a lot to your success. And I know that's one of the lessons that I've taken from you over the years. Like, for example, you're talking about the Celtic. Like right now, I'm mixing a, a Hypo Celtic Het Sharp with oh. a uh, European Purple Line Sharp just to see you know, what the hell's that going to look like, right? Absolutely. Is, is, the, is the dark, thick saddles of a Celtic going to make the Purple Sharp even purpler? You know, like did, who, who, know, who knows? Where did you get that Celtic from? I got it off of Morph, Morph Market, man, and I got it cheap because, no, like you said, people were sleeping on it. You know what I was mean? It, was it imported from Europe? Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. That's my point is that some of these – like I've been noticing lately like some of the stuff that people doing in Europe are way ahead of the game, way, way ahead of the game because they took a different route. And if anything, that should be like your your blueprint of how to do it. Like some of those guys over there, some of the stuff they're doing, I see and I'm like – Oh God, like that's crazy. But the, it's, it's, it's crazy. They're, they're ahead in, they're ahead in a lot of regards, man. And I, that Celtic thing is a perfect example. Cause I knew, I knew you didn't get that in the U S because very few people, very few people are working with it. And most of the people are, is I've gotten my stuff from, from, from uh, a guy named Richard who all Im imports it from Europe. So yeah. And like, for example, like my Celtic stuff was just a throne. I was hap I, I happened to be helping a buddy down in Phoenix import some uh, ball pythons actually from England, right? Yeah, And yeah. this thing just ended up, you know, getting thrown in there for a nominal fee as a kind of a, as a thank you. So I was like, yeah, yeah let, let's Good for make you. that happen, dude. You know what I mean? Good for you, man. I look forward to seeing what you can make, man, because that, oh man, especially with the purple, the purple stuff that, that's coming in from over there, it's crazy. It's crazy. Good for you, bro. Good for you. 
Yeah, man. All right, brother. So we're going to take a quick break real quick. And uh, when we come back, we are going to talk about uh, your work with uh, BEAs. Okay. All right, guys, we're back. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is uh, what it takes to essentially produce the best example of a gene uh, within your collection. So when I first met Chaz through our mutual friend, Brad Sherman, uh, the thing that struck me the most was the high level uh, of quality that he was producing within all his animals. And not only were the animals that he was uh, producing super high levels and some of the hottest uh, genes in the industry at the time, but they were probably like the best examples of that particular gene that I had seen up to that point. So... Um, I attribute that to the fact that uh, Chaz has always been really particular about selecting the right breeding stock. So Chaz, tell me, what does it take to select the right breeding stock and uh, what do you look for when you're bringing stuff into your collection? Um, people's holdbacks. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I'll be honest, man. I, I don't, I learned kind of how to pick snakes and the, and how to value quality from um, Tony that I was telling you about earlier, Green Ant. Yeah. Um, when I met him in 2009 and the first time I went and visited him, I was just like, literally, I was just blown away because like, not only did he have rare snakes, it would have been, it would have been one thing just to have rare, you know, VPIs and all this stuff, but he his all of his examples were great. And he took a lot of pride in like the bloodline and where it came from. And uh, they were just all 10 out of 10 you know, examples pretty much for the most part. So when I sat and thought about it, it's, it's you know, it's the foundation of, 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 of you. It's the foundation of your projects. If you don't start with really good quality, then it's, it's going to be hard to make up ground. So that's where I kind of learned that. I tried to emulate him. I tried to buy really, really nice examples of anything, it, not even super expensive boas. Like I would, I would try to get the best bloodlines of ghosts, the best bloodlines of anery, the best bloodlines of jungle, because, um, it matters but specifically and ev ev what what everyone considers good i like very aberrant jungles or i like very connected motleys everyone could be different but you kind of have to identify like what is quality to you right and then i i was i was gonna say as pretty much a good example of like why you want to buy into a specific look like say you're looking at 10 breeders say you say you have one breeder that has extremely high prices but you just absolutely love the look of what he produces Okay. Say there's, but there's another breeder that has a little bit lower prices and the quality is almost as good, but not quite. It's not quite the same. Um, you're going to have to pay. You're going to have to pay for it if you want it, because if you want to replicate some of these snakes, like I could throw out a couple examples. Um, Richard Siniceros makes great VPI motleys. All of his RC motleys have extremely red tails. Uh, Kyle Frost makes extremely nice ghosts and anneries. He's put right. a lot of time and effort into holding back good stock. And he knows what he's doing. Jeff Ronnie makes his pastel dream monster tail bloodline is absolutely some the best thing ever. It's awesome. But if you want to replicate that look, you need to buy into it. You could try to do this breeding a thousand times over, and it, you're just not going to replicate that look. If you want to make pastel dream monster tail animals, you got to go to the you source. might have to pay a little bit more. Yeah, you got you you got to outsource, and you might have to pay a little bit more. But on the back end, you'll be you'll be way happier you did. And I could go I could go on down the line. Tony Antonucci makes great VPI IMGs. If you want to make if you want to make snakes like what you're seeing out there, sometimes you're going to have to go and you're going to have to buy directly from the people. But as far as specifically like what what makes a good morph, um, when I'm inquiring or when I used to look at buying more animals, I'd ask for pictures of the parents. I'd like to see pictures of the litter, see what the whole litter looks like, because sometimes you can get an anomaly. Like one snake can come out looking great, but when you have a whole litter and the whole litter is banging like the whole litter looks good then that i would say that quality is pretty high like pretty pretty high so um i mean that that's just me but everyone could be different i don't know i don't know how other people pick their snakes or how other people look at bloodlines i can tell you early on when i used to look at a lot of stuff i used to think about like let's take this for example i don't know if you've thought about this like what makes a good jungle motley for me what i realized is that it takes a weaker patterned motley like a very, very weak pattern motley to make a good jungle motley, like where it looks more jungly than more motley. Right. 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 And you can apply that to anything. Like what makes a good 
Key West Motley. So you just have to take into account like how, how do the genes react to each other? And then are you starting off with the best possible foundation of bloodlines that you can get your hands on? And that's, that's kind of my philosophy or kind of how I've done it. I've, I've, I've tried to, it doesn't, it doesn't, and it doesn't always come out exactly how you want it to, but you're giving yourself the best shot if you start with high quality and then you think about, just sit there and think about, think about like how do they react or go online and look at previous people's litters and be like, well, I like that guy's litter. That's what his parents look like. How, how can I recreate that? Or how can I do it better? Maybe myself. So that's, that's kind of how I do it. I don't know if I, I don't know if I answer that quite fully, but no, I think I think that was good, man. Um, so let me ask you: um, Why do you think it's important to focus on pushing the hobby forward versus trying to chase uh, what's what's hot at the moment? Um, you could take what I say with a grain of salt. This is just my opinion, but I don't. For me, I believe in in. So for me, I I'm firmly firmly in the boat of uh, pushing the hobby forward. Um, I say there's more value in creating something new for especially for yourself as a breeder, as opposed to just cashing in and doing, doing what everyone else is doing. Um, I could give you a couple of reasons. You, you can make no mistake. If you, if you, uh, you know, make stuff yourself, take the long road. It, it is long road. It's, it's a lot harder. You know, I breed, I still breed head to head or head to visual because there's still stuff that I'm shooting for. And it's just, it's a odds. It's a, it's a odds. It's a numbers yeah, it's game. game. And, uh, yeah, it's a long, it takes a long time to make some of the stuff that I'm kind of shooting for, but I'm doing it because it's the snakes that I want to make. Uh, I could have made 100 VPIs by now, but I chose to kind of do things differently. Or I could have made a bunch of other stuff, but for me, it's more rewarding when I've made my own heads, my own double heads or triple heads, and then I bred those back together from other outcries and bloodlines, and I produce something. So I think it's more rewarding. Um, and then personally, I think for my business model, like... I do good enough with the snakes that I produce right now, but I think in the long term, I think my collection and the stuff I'll produce will be way more valuable, valuable because number one, I have created myself. And then the snakes that I'm shooting for, they, they are incredibly hard to make. You know what? They, they're, they're hard. It's not like I'm just trying to recreate a, a lot of what's out there. A lot of stuff that I'm doing, it either hasn't been done or it's still in the infancy stage. So I think down the road when I have snakes that, you know, like five and six codoms with double and triple recessives, I think that will kind of be the bar, I think, to be honest with you. I think snakes that are incredibly hard to make, that are incredibly com complex, and every single gene is in the snake, it'd just be awesome. But yeah. that's kind of where I stand. I don't know. No, I'm with you, dude. I think um, one of the things that's a reality out here is the fact that the most successful guys in the industry create a certain level of boa envy within you know other breeders right yeah. and the guys yeah. that, that are able to do that are really the guys that are out there doing what you're doing they're chasing more difficult to make snakes versus just trying to produce you know having a litter of all visual vpis that they're going to be able to sell for 800 bucks you know if yeah that, yeah right they rather yeah. they rather get stuck with a bunch of triple heads right that maybe mm -hmm. they're only going to get you know uh two three four hundred bucks a piece realistically probably more than that but with the hope of hitting on a visual you know triple head right and i yeah. think when you do that uh if i would give anybody a tip to really push their collection forward is try to produce the stuff that you dream about try to produce exactly. the stuff that you have no idea what it's going to look like but you exactly. sure as hell will have fun finding out right exactly i think when you do that number one yes you're not going to produce as many visuals as maybe somebody else but Here's the reality. The people that you're going to end up selling those triple heads to usually will be guys like us because we're the ones that yeah. are interested in pushing, you know, particular projects forward. The reality yeah. is we produce a bunch of, you know, single gene recessives, for lack of a better term, yep. right? Most of yep. the people that are going to end up picking that up, picking those up is the people that are going to be new to the hobby. They just want, you know, a cool looking snake that maybe they've been saving up for a while to try to purchase. Right. And yeah. the reality is those are two separate business models. Right. And there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with following either one of those two business models. But if you want to create that level of BOA envy that I think is necessary to be successful a lot of times, you have to kind of push the envelope, you know? Yeah, you said it absolutely way better, way better than I said it. I mean, that's that is exactly what I'm getting at. Is that it's it's hard, it's it's hard to make, but the boas that are the most valuable and the most rewarding, they they are the hardest to make. They're they're the hardest to make, and you have to kind of take a step out there. Like, 
I think you may have talked about it previously on an episode, but when Tracy first made her triple heads, like not a lot of people wanted bottom. Not yeah. a lot. She 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 sat on a lot of them for a long, long time. Yeah, but and let's I think we're a, talking to John Chosmer about that, and it paid off big time yeah. for the guy. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Let's take a step back and let's look at the people that, that are pretty successful, or I would classify as being successful bow breeders. John Chosmar, Tony Antonucci, uh, other guys that have they're they're breeding these snakes that are very very hard to make it's not just the guys and 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 there are there are completely different business models i think there's a hundred percent room for people that are just making the most banging lipstick sun glow jungles day and night year after year absolutely because they sell excuse me excuse me because they sell they're beautiful you can take them you can take them to a show and people will absolutely go nuts over them but there's also another place for your five thousand dollar triple heads <laughs> right? Yeah. that are normals that you have to raise up that you got to make yourself. And to be honest, I think people would be shocked if you saw, if, if I posted up online or people came over and saw my collection, frankly, I think people would be pretty shocked about still how many heads I have or yeah. how many single gene double heads I have. Like I don't have a lot of visuals. Like I'll be the first people to tell you, you can ask anyone. I, I do have visuals mo- mainly or they're my holdbacks, but I make a lot of heads, like a lot of pos heads yep. and a lot of, double and triple heads because I'm shooting to make something different. So everyone's different, man. I, I, I'm, I also am fortunate that I don't have to, I don't feel like I'm required every year to make a certain amount of number, make a certain amount of boas. I just go with, go with, I write down my plan. I go with the breedings and I see what comes up. And, and here's another thing I can think of every year I go and write down my breedings and it's not, I, I do my breedings not about how can I make as many visuals as I can make or how can I cash in or how can I just, you know, make what people want. I literally go and say, what are, what's the most powerful snakes I have? What's right. the most powerful female? What's the most powerful male? Sometimes it's not really what I want to do, but I'll do the breeding. I'll do the breeding. Kind of like uh, a couple years ago, I did a IMG ghost jungle to that was Pos Het T, an IMG, IMG ghost jungle to a Motley Fire. Oh, I to remember be honest, this breeding. Yeah, I remember. It. Yeah, to be honest, I think ninety percent of other people would have taken that IMG Ghost Jungle Pos Het T, and they would have bred it to a T positive, just to right. prove it out. I'm pretty sure. What do I do? Well, I take the road much, much less taken. To be yeah. honest with you, why? Because I want to see how IMG affects with fire, and the litter was off the charts. Now, people, it's still not a mainstream thing, and it's still something I'm chasing. But that's the type of stuff I'm talking about. Like I. I, I tend to go off the beaten path because I see what other people do and I love what they do, but their dreams are not my, my dreams and where I want to go is completely different. And, and, and I think, I think eventually I'll get there. It's just, it's, it's a long road. It's a long road. It's not always rewarding. I definitely can tell you a hundred percent. I haven't made as much money as other people have made and I could have made more money, but I like the projects I have and I feel like I, I'm just getting started. So <laughs> I feel good about where I'm at. Oh yeah, dude. Absolutely. Absolutely. And hell, man, I, there's a lot of times where I see you, because, um, you know, knowing you and knowing uh, Brad, I see you guys kind of throwing up some breedings that are almost like Hail Mary type breedings, and it pays off. Like, I remember when you guys made that IMG VPI yeah. Snow Jungle Motley, uh, I think yeah. like in, back in 2017. I, I think I was at Brad's house shortly after that thing was born. Dude. Yeah, I just, mo- I just moved into a new house, yeah. and in the process of selling my old house and moving, he... I bid the breeding in my old house and then I got her grab it and I shipped her over to his place, but he had it. But yeah, that's yeah. exactly what you're I talking about. I think I showed about. up like the I day made... after it was born because Brad was like, dude, we just had a killer yeah. glitter from Chaz drop, the gra- drop on the ground. It just happened at the yeah. time that uh, yeah. Dave you're talking about a was at my house. Gene. Yeah. And, uh-huh. Well, I don't know if I ever told you this, dude. So Dave Schmidt, right, happened to be at my house at that time because he was going through military freefall school in, uh, um, in Arizona, right? And uh, we both drove uh-huh. over to, to Brad's place, and he saw that thing, dude. I think the day after that, like, he invested all his savings back into Boas. He was like, you know what, dude? Uh, yeah. Like, that motiva- <laughs> that single litter dude, I think, motivated him so much that it yeah. inspired him to get back into Boas kind of really heavily, whereas before, he, you know, he had one or two here or there. That's what I'm talking about. That means the world to me, man. That means the world to me because that's honestly what I'm shooting for. Something that you haven't seen before, but when you see it, you're like, boom, that's it. That's it. That snake was so incredibly hard for me to make. I made my own. The the odds alone are insane. Yeah, the odds are off the charts, but when I made it 
and now she's six and a half feet and I'm going to breed her next year. Like it's just, not only is it incredibly powerful, powerful snake, not only was it hard to make, but it's just very rewarding to know that it took me that long and I was successful. So, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, that's, that's my perspective. And, and I'm glad that, that I could maybe motivate or inspire Dave. And that's cool, man. That's really cool. Yeah, man. So, um, now I want to talk a little bit about your work with uh, the black eyed Annery stuff. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people really tend to focus on the bright colored stuff, but there's a couple of rogue dudes in the industry like yourself, Big Mike, uh, John Chosmer, Mm -hmm. who really have seen the potential in the darker boas. So kind of give me a little bit of of background about your work with uh, the BEAs and kind of what attracted you to them. Um, My first introduction to them was uh, when I went out and visited Big Mike a long, long time ago. Um, That's when Ralph Davis, which was is what RDR stands for. Um, he had the whole project. He had imported them. And um, I think Ralph was getting out of boas, and Mike ended up buying the whole um, Ralph's whole collection of RDRs from him. So uh, I went over, and I saw them all, and I was just like, I was just literally like, wow. Like, these are some crazy, pitch black, super aberrant. Underneath their, on their undertones, there's like it's like a silver blue. And uh, I was just I was blown away. I was really blown away away they're almost like an img but with pattern and uh they get they don't brown out with age they stay incredibly black so uh when i went over there and saw them for the first time i remember we stayed up till like three or four in the morning and we were just shooting the shit talking about like where could what could you actually do with those because at that time there hadn't been really anything done he had just produced some visuals i think he had some motley's some motley's had rdr and nothing had been done with them so i was like man you need to breathe this into sharp which was what he did. He needed to bred him into sharp. He bred him into call. He bred him into VPI. And uh, years later, that's where I ended up getting my um, my triple my triple heads um, hypos head specter and head RDR or VPI from was was from his breeding. So um, that's kind of my my background of how I got into him. I saw the potential. It just took me a few years to get some snakes from him. But um, when when the first time I saw him, I was like, these are awesome. They're they're literally kind of exactly what i like because i do like snakes that are a little darker to be honest with you so so what are your goals uh currently with uh with ba genes uh whether it's uh you know the rdr stuff or the carbon stuff from kenny what are what, yeah. what are some of the goals that you're currently you know working on um first now that i've i've been able to make a few specters and i have some good holdbacks that i'm raising up uh outcross which hopefully i'll in a week or two hopefully i'll have that accomplished but just to outcross some of the blood so I can make my own bloodline stronger. And then um, second is really getting it into uh, all the VPI stuff, obviously, that I already have. Um, I've been working on some specific type of uh, VPIs that turn very, very green. Like green is like neon green. So yeah, I'd love green, to get like Green pastel like a, kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. I've been calling it gamma green or green gene or whatever. But I, I give you the quick background on it. In yeah. 2010, I bought this pure green, like pure, pure green jungle motley VPI from Jeremy. And uh, it was one of his holdbacks and I paid a lot of money for it, but it was, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And uh, I ended up breeding that to a, a hedge path super ghost and I made, I made a litter and half of the babies were just a really bizarre, a really, really bizarre light green. And I held most of them back. Um, and uh, that's kind of the founding founding where i've gotten all my green gene stuff from that litter that you said that you saw at brad's the vpi img snow jungle motley's yep all, throughout all that litter that green gene is floating around there oh yeah dude so, I, I actually have a motley jungle uh green from you right now female that uh, oh it's awesome. probably the meanest bastard in my collection but <laughs> she eats well that's good that means she'll be a great breeder <laughs> yeah that's right man <laughs> well um yeah that's so i'm i'm i really want to get the specter because my adult male specter is like it's first of all they he goes they go through color phases big time during the day he's more like a black and gray and then at night he cleans up and he turns into a a a legitimately like a light blue like a light steel blue color so i'd like to mix that into that green green line of vpi that i'm working on and then uh really man (laughs) everything vpi i think when you get a combo on top of it especially like a key west jungle motley labyrinth um anything man black eyed annery i think the the well not let me rephrase that not black eyed annery 
because I'd, I, I would like to keep it separate from what Ke- Kenny's working on because I have a lot of respect for that and I think that it's already a great quality. But uh, man, there's there's no co- there's no Kodom gene that I wouldn't like to get into the Spectre. So that's my plan. That's my plan for the years to come is just to breed it to VPI stuff and outcross it and get some badass Kodoms in there. Absolutely, man. Um, currently, what what other projects are you working on uh, as far as like darker snakes? Um. Th- a lot I've been trying, and like I was telling you before, I, I haven't been – the stuff that you want the most, you're not always successful for, and then you get blessed to be successful with other stuff that maybe you weren't expecting. But I would love, love, love to produce more Black Eyed Anery stuff from Kenny's line. Um, I think I think it's awesome. It's, it, it's literally such a clean, crisp form of black. It's not like – it's. It's kind of like an IMG. It's hard to explain, man. It's it's, it's really it's hard like to explain. It's like a purplish it. black, if it makes any sense. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, have you seen how red some of Kenny's Aztecs are? Yeah, like, no, totally. Some, they're literally the reddest. They're, I call them like red text. They're literally just pure red. And I think what makes the black eyed anneries that he's working with so nice is that that red underneath is just like somehow transferring through. It's just making a crisp, clean, huh. pure red black eyed anery, but. I would love, love to work to, to produce some of those. I've actually bred a really nice red rum um, VPI to a Black Eyed Anery Aztec that I'm pr- pretty sure is had VPI girl this year. Yeah. And she's pretty loaded, so we'll see. Um, we'll see what's come of that. But that's it'll be good for outbreeding, and it'll be good for the project, man, because I really, really think – like when just the quality, I think, of the VPI Aztecs that come out of that breeding will be off the charts, man, because that, that Black Eyed Anery gene is a – it's – it's really, really nice. I'm a huge fan of it. And then as far as like other snakes, I'm working with that with the with the demon stuff with my type one blood stuff. And then just nice VPI snows, VPI snow glows, um, from my own lines kind of, and that's kind of where I'm at, man. That's awesome, dude. So let me ask you, why do you think, you know, the black eyed anery gene in general is supposed to be one of the key genes in the hobby in the future? That is a great question. I am glad you asked that. Um there's a couple. There's a couple reasons. First of all, uh, it's completely untapped. It's completely untapped. Like you said earlier, pretty much the only ones really doing it are me, Mike, and Kenny. As far as like the whole black eyed anery thing, but specifically me, the me and Mike, the RDR stuff. But um, it's completely untapped. Um, I take what I say with a grain of salt. I hope I don't piss off a lot of people, but I really think it's a better. I made a hypo specter last year. And it was a little bit paradox, but I think once you start to get more of these patterns on top of like specters and stuff, I think it'll be almost a better version of like the VPI snow glows. Yeah. Cause it's a snake that the pattern shows through better. It has dark burgundy eyes. The eyes aren't black. The eyes are burgundy. And I think that they're very hardy. Um, and it's just, it's untapped. I think I truly think in five, six years as I am able to produce more and Mike's able to produce more and people see them. I just think it's, it's, the sky, the sky is the limit. And then, um, you know, kind of looking back on on things, people, I think people forget what like the first VPIs looked like. Like, oh, yeah. granted, a couple years ago, I made the first Spectre. It was great, but I had someone uh, message me a couple days ago and ask me like if I was going to make another Spectre and would I sell it. And I said, to be honest, I can't even really tell you because I don't even know if the first Spectre I made or the Hypo Spectre I made. I don't even know if it was a good example. And it turns out, like, <laughs> it actually was just an average example. Right. Because the one I just made a couple days ago is much, much better. And I haven't even done any outcrossing. I haven't even bred in any pastel lines. I haven't done anything. It's just, it's the first generation of it. So if you go back and, like, look at the first VPIs, if you took a picture and posted it online right now of the first VPIs that were really out there, I don't even think people would, I think people would say that's not a VPI. Right. I really do. I really think they would. If you kind of see where I'm going, like, so... With more time, more outcrossing, more breeding, like a better refinement. bloodlines. Yeah, yeah. Like it just takes time, and I think that as it's refined, and as I do more breedings, I think it'll just get better and better, and we'll end up with my goal. I can kind of tell you, my goal is kind of end up with like a very clean, pretty much blue, like bluish snake, which is what what he, my guy already looks like at night. So, um, that's that's kind of my goal, man. That's kind of why I think it's poised to be the next project. Um, and also they're, they're incredibly variable. Like their patterns, right. 
the patterns on some they're they're really stripy they they can and i don't know how that'll mix with other genes necessarily how would it mix with leopard motley labyrinth um you know no one really that's what i'm waiting to see i like i love the look of labyrinth man but you know seeing a all black and white labyrinth that that mm-hmm. really catches my attention you know like a oh, BEA you're Henry labyrinth right. oof that's going to be smoking that's what dude, especially that's with, that's what and, and honestly go ahead, go ahead. i think i think probably the line that i think would work the best with that is particularly Kenny's carbon line i think a mm-hmm. carbon labyrinth is going to be absolutely phenomenal i know Kenny's currently chasing that project yeah yeah, I, I I'm I'm a hundred percent with you. I'm sorry to if I was interrupting you there, but oh, no worries, man. I so let let me phrase it this way: like I love the Spectre stuff. It's it's my own project, and I feel like I've done some good things with it. But Kenny's Carbon Project is absolutely off the charts. It's it's even a much cleaner, much brighter, like first generation of that thing. It I feel like it it smokes what I've done. It's it's true. Truly, truly mind blowing. It's pretty much a pure white and black snake, and it's it's. I feel like that has so much potential, and he's done such a great job with that project. I'm really just. I'm a fan of what he's done in his snakes. So yeah, I I'm, I 100% agree. If you can get that into labyrinth, if you can get that into some other outcross a little more, it's just it's going to be great, man. The sky's the limit. Well, here's the beauty of that dude is the fact that I think both whether you're going RDR or carbon, I think they both offer particular traits that are going to work better with different genes right and i think as more people start working with those things we're going to end up discovering what those combos are going to be so like an example that i throw out there all the time right uh actually comes from the ball python industry and that's the enchi okay Mm -hmm. so that gene Mm -hmm. was a gene that for about a 10 year period right the majority of the 2000s people were like "Eh, it's just another type of pastel who gives a shit right and people completely ignored it right and then it just took it yeah. being combined with the right things and all of a sudden you saw enchies from going you know selling for a hundred bucks on kingsnake.com all of a sudden they jumped to like twelve hundred dollars for just yeah. a, a single code on enchi right and i think yeah. that's the same thing that's going to end up happening for those people that maybe are sleeping on rdr and on carbon stuff right now their genes that are you know if if you just go with you know an rdr okay It's, you know, it's not cheap, but it's affordable, right? Mm -hmm. And I think for the ones smart enough to get into the game now, right, once that perfect combo gets hit, you know, they're going to be so far ahead that they're going to be able to actually produce stuff. But the people that are going to end up chasing are going to be kicking themselves in the ass. Yeah, you're 100% right. You're 100% right. Yeah, it's funny you said that about the ball python industry because I've even within the last year, I've started taking a look at, how some of those guys do their business and and uh, i've i've been personally i've been studying jkr reptiles i don't know if you've oh absolutely he's like the yeah. industry standard but he is his work is primarily mixing in double and triple recessives clowns pides other stuff in with 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 kind of genes that have been forgotten about and i took a hard look at how he how successful he is and how he's done what he's done and it's been through things like adding leopard into clown adding uh, spot nose in a clown yeah, adding red stripe. Another, and another, people, another great example of genes that were you know cheap five years ago, and then yeah, he produced it, found the right combos, and now those things are through the roof. Exactly, and I know you've touched on it too when you say like the blood gene used to be a lot cheaper, and that's that's kind of what I think about is like how can I take these things that people have kind of discarded? And granted, the ball python is accelerated because they're so easy to breed and they they're they're so hardy. They breed year after year, but like. There's a ton of projects in the boa world that, that have just been kind of fell by the wayside. And I, you've already touched on them before. Like whatever happened to more boa woman caramels or Russian tea positive yeah. bloods or other stuff that used to be around. And then they literally just – they literally disappeared because people got, you know, sidetracked with other stuff. But there's there's other stuff out there that can be done. You know, some of the ball python people are pretty far ahead because they figured out that you can take a very readily accessible quality gene that's been forgotten about and you can plug it in. And they've had success. The bow world just needs to kind of catch up and, and follow suit, to be honest with you. Yeah, 100%, man. All right, brother, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to do the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen. All right, guys, it's time for the Dirty Dozen. So, Chaz, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a series of 12 questions. You can give me a short or as long of an answer to each one that you want, okay? 
Cool. All right, brother. Number one, what's the current size of your collection? It's around 80 to 100, give or take. And then uh, every year I make around 100, give or take, babies. So it kind of ends in flux all the time, but not that much, man. I don't have that many snakes, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think you're pretty much where I'm at. All right, number two, uh, husbandry-related question. Are you a frozen and thawed guy or a live guy, and what's your bedding choice? So I do pre-killed mice and rats for everything up to about a year. And uh, shout out to Brad Sherman because he produces shout all my mice Brad. and yeah. Shout out to Brad because he he produces all my mice and rats for me, which by the way is pretty hard in Arizona. Man, there's not a lot of rodent yeah. breeders out here. It's hard to get quality rodents. It's very very hard, very rare. Yeah, um, man. So yeah. absolutely. So and then I. I do frozen thawed for the adults and I get those from uh, big cheese and lane lane labs. Okay. Awesome. And, uh, as far as bedding choice, are you still on car corrugated car, uh, cardboard? Yeah. Yeah. For everything, everything up to about a year I do, uh, I do Aspen and then, uh, I do cardboard corrugated card cardboard for everything else. It's just easy and clean. I pre-cut it all and makes, makes life a lot easier. Awesome, man. And for the ones that don't know, Brad Sherman's, Another one of these guys that, you know, is probably one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in the hobby. He's one of my favorite people in the hobby. And the dude is extremely humble. And he's got this sneaky collection, man, that's growing and improving. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, people are going to start getting hip to Brad pretty soon, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, man. Number three, what's your favorite morph or locality? A favorite, favorite morph would be uh, Jungle slash Labyrinth. And uh, it's pretty, it's, it's, as time goes on, it's more and more labyrinth, to be honest with you. But uh, favorite locality would be, uh, I don't know if people remember, but uh, do you remember Gus Renfro's uh, hyperpigmented Peruvians? Oh, absolutely. You remember? His purple yeah, Peruvians? Those, those yeah, those were like, yeah, they were really, really dark, like almost look like a burgundy purple when they were born. Uh, those by far, if I were to do a locality, which I've never had, um, specifically like that I, that's that's for sure what i would what i would go with i would love to have some of those awesome man all right number four what is the most overrated morph in your opinion uh i don't like to do this and i i've actually <laughs> had a few i've actually had a few um and i do see value in them but i can i just didn't and i didn't enjoy them i enjoyed them for like a first few weeks but the sterling like i I like pattern for what I like in my taste. I like a lot of pattern. Like I like labyrinths, jungles, jungle mollies, any type of combo you can get. But a snake, a snake that really doesn't have any pattern and I'm not sure how to get it on there. I mean, we could change the color of it, which people have done. Um, but, but I, 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 I'm not, I'm not big on labyrinths, but, but I would love to see someone do something awesome with it. And I know people are working on it. So my hat's off to them. Yeah. All right, man. Number five, what's the most underrated morph? Easy, easy. The black eyed anery from Kenny with Kenny Saito stuff. The carbon black eyed anery. Uh, for whatever reason, I have no clue. He has a bunch of visuals for sale right now, still like visual black eyed anneries, and I have no clue why. But that that project, and if I think if more people saw him, that that's so underrated. It's it's crazy. All right, man. Number six. What's your favorite part of the hobby? Um, making the babies, making babies, seeing kind of the the end result. Um, and then just cleaning. I, I enjoy getting out there cleaning, making whenever, when everything's perfectly clean and watered, that's satisfies me. So I don't know why, but that's, that's what I enjoy. All right. Number seven, what's the worst part of the hobby? Uh, selling, selling the snakes. You know, you spend all this time years and years to, to produce them. And, and, uh, even selling the stuff that you know you can't hold back, I just kind of like ah, uh, it, it's never it's never very fun. I don't I don't know if that's just me, but I don't enjoy. No, I'm, selling I'm with you on that, I, dude. That's the worst part. I wish I could hold back pretty much everything I produce, man. Yeah, yeah. And then I'd say the second part to that is window shoppers. Like oh, that was a large yes. reason why. Yes, it was a large reason why I got off Facebook, man. It's kind of a fifty fifty percent of the reason why I got off Facebook because I I window literally shoppers I mean, and tire kickers. Man. I was oof. Yeah, I would get to the point. Let me t let me take you through this scenario. Someone messaged you, say, "Hey, man, I'd really love to get some snakes from you." 
and they put together a package, like a nice package, like $10,000, $15,000. Okay. And maybe there's three or four snakes in there. And then over a week, they whittle it down to three snakes. And then a week later, it's, right. it's only two snakes. And then, and then, then they'll disappear for a month and then they'll come back. And a month later, it's like, oh, well, I really just want to get that one snake. But they want the price. They want the price that you're going to do the with price the from the package. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Like that to me, not only is it super disrespe- disrespectful, but at this point I have hours, you know, invested in this person. And, you know, I tried my hardest to have good customer service. I'm a human being. I, I make mistakes. I don't, I, I can get, I can get upset. I can have. You know, I don't have a lot of patience sometimes, but that type of stuff, I was just like, you know what? I, I would find myself, you know, trying to answer customers' questions and trying to have good customer service. And I find myself spending three, four, five hours sometimes, like trying to answer people. And finally, I just got to the point where I talked to my wife and I was like, I'm, I'm out on all this. You know, I can sell my snakes to repeat customers and people email me and I'll be just fine. And that's pretty much what I've done. So, <laughs> dude, I'm with you, dude. Like the worst is when you spend, you know, some significant time. Spe- and it always seems it's with the higher end stuff for some reason, which drives me absolutely nuts, right? So, like, mm-hmm. you spend time, you, you film videos. I've done FaceTime calls with people showing them animals, all this stuff. Right? Yeah. Only for them to come back a couple days later while they're supposedly getting the funds together, quote unquote, right? And yeah. they come back like, well, I found a similar animal from this guy and it's a thousand dollars cheaper. Can you match it? Yeah. Dude, that drives me absolutely nuts, dude. At that point, you just have really, at it, bro. Have at have it. it. Have Good at it. Good luck. Good luck. That's yeah. kind of what I feel like we've been just been talking about the last hour and a half is like, if you want it, like, and then here's another thing. I don't feel like my prices are very high. Like, no, I think you're, you're pretty like fair. I, how I've tried to kind of price my stuff and granted I'm not in the loop. I'm not on social media at all. I just kind of try to say like, what's, what's the most affordable right off the bat? Like, I don't want to haggle with you. I don't want to set my price super high and then give you a deal. I just want like, Hey, this is the price. Like repeat customer. You can get a tiny discount, but like, this is, this is how, this is the price, man. Like, and I feel like it's a good price, but you know, people just whittle you down at a certain point. You're like, I mean, man, are you serious? Yeah, man. Well, here's the deal, dude. I understand that people sometimes have limitations as far as price point and, uh, you know, what they can afford, right? And I get it. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I I completely understand that and I'm willing to work with people, okay? Because a lot of times yeah. what I've, you know, I've been doing this, you know, maybe three years longer than you have, right? Mm-hmm. And during that time, I've had a lot of people who have done payment plans with in the beginning that eventually became you know, on, on a, on a cheaper snake that eventually became the guys, you know, spending five grand with me, you know, on a snake. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I'm totally open to that. But the thing that drives me nuts is when people have wavering commitments. Yes. And unfortunately, a lot of what they, what they don't see from our end is we will maybe go out on a limb and hold a snake for a certain person because they have, yes. they've made some sort of commitment. Well, while we're holding that snake, what you don't see is we're actually losing out on other potential sales. Because exactly. there's many times where I produce like a really, so I'll give you an example. I think I was one of the first dudes to produce the VPI, uh, Sunglow Jungles and the, and the Super Sunglow Jungles, right? This is before we knew that mm-hmm. Super, that, uh, Super Jungles weren't really crazy viable, right? When it was still up in the air. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there was somebody, I, I think I had listed them at the time for, I think it was like 6,400 bucks, right? And somebody came in and said, you know what? I only have 5,000 bucks. I have to do it over a three-month period. Are you willing to do it? And I had done a little bit of business with this person in the past. Where I was like, oh, I told him, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. We'll, we'll make it happen, right? Send me a deposit mm-hmm. or anything, and uh, we can go from there. Well, the day after, another person was like, hey, man, I'll, I'll give you your 6,400 bucks for it. I want it. You know what I mean? And unfortunately, exactly. I, had to, I had to be like, sorry, man, this is already sold. You know, I, I appreciate you yeah. offering that, but, you know, I don't want to sell. I have one more, but it's my holdback and I'm not going to sell it, you know? Yeah. And that ended up happening three, four more times over the next like two, three weeks. Well, guy comes back after that and he's like, you know what? Uh, change of plans. I'm looking into a new project. Can I get my $500 deposit back? You know? Exactly. And at that point, exactly. I'm a nice guy, so and I didn't want to have any beef with the guy. So I was like, yeah, take your 500 bucks. But after that point, like I made a mental note in my head. I'm like, I am never going to purchase shit from this dude again. Yeah. I'm not going to hook this guy up again because they essentially burned me out of 1400 bucks that I could have had at that moment, you know? Yeah. So Yeah, I, even I, I, even 
I think when people are, are account. buying, they need to they need to appreciate kind of the situation that the breeder is in at that time. Yeah, because we're human beings. I'm over here cleaning it for you. I'm feeding it for you free of charge. I'm housing it. I'm doing. I'm still taking care of it like it's my own. You know, like so. Take this into account. Think about this. I, I used to have. I ran into this a couple times where people would beg me for discounts, and I would give them discounts on payment plan, and then I would talk to my other friends only to find out that they owed. They they were on payment plans with other people too. Like, right. and they right. and they were running late on their 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 payments on other people. So it makes you think like, come on, man. And I and, I, and I'll be honest. I love payment plans. Why? Because. I understand most people are blue collar, have working blue collar jobs. Like most people need those. And that's a great way to be able to buy a snake that you can't purchase up front. And I, I totally support it. I do almost all payment plans, but there's a certain etiquette about how people, how people should go about it. I feel like, and you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. You can definitely feel when you're getting to take advantage of, or, um, people are kind of just stringing you along. So oh, I, I have no problem with any price point, no problem with any price point. So that's why. It doesn't matter if it's three hundred dollars or three thousand dollars, but there's just a right way to go about it. I feel like. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that, and, and and I'll be honest, I've done a lot of payment plans, and I hope my wife's not listening, so I could sneaky buy shit <laughs> without her knowing that I'm spending X yeah. amount of dollars on a snake, right? So I get that, but yeah. the one thing that I will tell you is, every time I'm on a payment plan, I'm never late on it, I never default on it. You know what I mean? Because it it, it kind of goes back to that old adage, okay, of that of your word is only as good as your word is. You know what I'm saying? So if I give you my yeah. word that I'm going to yeah. buy something off of you, I'm going to go through hell to make sure that regardless of what's happening in my life that I accomplish, you know, whatever I need to accomplish with that those terms because I know that certain breeders are big breeders and maybe they they have flexibility where they can extend that out, but a lot of the guys that I buy from are smaller guys, you know what I mean? And maybe yeah. they might be depending on that particular payment to make the wrap build next month. You know what I'm saying? So I, I try to I try to yeah, respect their true. hustle, you know, just as much as I would want somebody to respect mine. All right, brother. Yeah, that's a good now, point, man. Next question, man. Number eight. Um, what other species do you keep? Uh, and if you don't keep other species, what other species would you like to potentially keep one day? Um, I I don't keep any other species. I uh, I did do. I got pretty. I dove head first into ball pythons a couple years ago like in 2013 through <laughs> yeah, 2016 yeah. and i was actually shocked by like how much immediate success i had i had with them right away like making brand new things and um they're just really easy i enjoyed it um but, but it's a volatile now, market I, man. I, yeah yeah you know what it's it's there's just thousands like hundreds of thousands of them and uh i i, I don't know it wasn't for me and uh I couldn't feed as many as I had, man. It was, it's incredibly hard to feed, um, you know, a hundred, 200 ball pythons. Boas Just are more pain my style. Yeah. 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 And I didn't want to, I didn't want to do something that anyone else, you know, almost everyone can do. I feel like that's why I take a lot of pride in boas because they, they are, they take a lot more time and effort. They are more difficult to breed. And, and I enjoy the process. I enjoy the ups. Um, I don't enjoy the downs, but I, the, 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 the low points help, help me appreciate when I do succeed. So, um, for me, I just do boas, man. I'm completely obsessed and just in love with boas. I, lo I love them, man, and that's the species for me. If I were to do anything else uh, reptile-wise, I would love to meet, maybe either breed like large tortoises or um, some monitors, some species of monitors. I, I would love to do that, but um, I just felt like I can't be successful. I'm having a hard enough time being successful at bows, so I should just stick with one thing for now. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, man. But I'm surprised you don't have any tortoises, man. The Phoenix thing is to have, you know, that tortoise lawnmower in, in your backyard. Oh, yeah. Your grass trim. Oh, That's yeah. Funny. A big a big 100-pound sulcata roaming around your backyard. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, brother. Number nine, what's a common misconception about you? Um, uh, I would probably say that my pictures are fake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I can guarantee that. they're fucking real, man. Haven't seen your yeah. snakes. Yeah. So I used to post a lot online. Um, I, I take a lot of pride in my pictures. I'm not saying that I'm a professional photographer, but I know how to take a picture of a, of a boa constrictor. I've, I've got it down pretty decently good and I have a nice setup and I take my snakes outside. So, and I, here's another thing I'll put out there just so 
people can listen. I know people have accused me or whatever. I only, only take pictures of my snakes, like nice pictures of my snakes when they look their best. So I've heard people say, well, I've seen his snakes or the snakes he's sold at shows. And of course, they're not going to look good at show. It's been shipped across the U.S. and stuffed in a box and it's out in a table in the middle all day long. It's not going to look the same as when it's super fired up at 5 p.m. as a sun setting on my driveway. And I have right. the perfect in, indirect light and the perfect yep. angle. And um, so um, that's me, man. I've, I've, I've taken hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pictures. You can ask Tony P. You can ask Kyle Frost. You can ask Richard Siniceros. Um, anybody that knows me, like I take pictures. That's what I do. Um, I take a lot of pride in it. I enjoy it. I enjoy it, enjoy it just as much as breeding boas. But uh, yeah, my, my pictures aren't doctored. My snakes are real. And that's probably a misconception. Yeah, man. <laughs> All right. Number 10. Uh, what makes you say, what was I thinking when you look back at your time in the hobby? Um... I say that all the time. <laughs> uh, there's probably not a month that goes by. I don't say that, but um, I would say most, mostly about there's some people that I used to be friends with um, that, you know, you grow apart and life happens and maybe you're not, you don't agree with some of the things they do. And uh, I still wish that, even though I don't see eye to eye with some, some of these guys, some of the bigger breeders out there and um, some other guys, I still wish that, you know, we could be closer friends, but um, you know, some of that's my fault. Some of it's not, you know, I, I won't get into the details of it. I, I could, but um, I just wish that when I first got into Boas, I really truly thought that you could just be friends with everyone and everyone would be cool and no one's going to try to take advantage of you. And I, some of those things, thoughts were never even on my mind but you know some some things happen some stuff happens life happens everyone's human everybody makes mistakes um i feel like everybody has regrets whether they're willing to say totally. them or not but uh um there's certain things that i said online um or argued about online that i never wish i would have said and uh there's certain there's certain stuff i've said and the ways i've acted that have not been humble and not been um uh, you know just i don't know i i just wish i have chosen to stay offline and stay anonymous. And I wish that, uh, I wish everyone the best of luck. And, uh, for me, that's, that's, that's my main thing is that I still wish I had a few close friends that, that weren't necessarily my, my friends before or, or that I was friends with before. Yeah, no, I, I got you, man. All right. Number 11. What's one tip you would give the people looking to invest in boas? Um, one tip. It's repetitive. It's what I would say every other, all the guys say, but pick, pick what you want. Like I, I wanted to talk about Rich Del Bono for a second, but Hey, that guy loves central boas. And yep. I didn't even know that he, two things until I listened to this podcast, I didn't know he did it full time. And I didn't know that he only works with centrals. So centrals, not everybody even loves him, but if he can be successful and be successful and see his vision through with a project like that, and make crazy cool unique stuff like he he does you know my hat's off to him dude that that got, that that podcast was super inspirational because it lets you know that if you have enough passion and drive and commitment you can be successful you can be absolutely successful so i would say pick what you want and and run with it 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 doesn't have to be a labyrinth it can be you know call albinos it can be whatever but pick pick something you truly love because you have to clean it you have to look at it every day yep. you're going to have that snake for a long time man so pick you you might as well enjoy looking at it and it should bring you some type of success, satisfaction because if you're just out there saying well i'm gonna chase this person or i'm gonna try to make it this before this person you're literally gonna end up with snakes that you don't even there's a good chance you might end up with snakes that you don't even really like and you don't even care for to be honest with you if you don't it, it, you know you know what i'm saying i don't, I don't oh, know absolutely that makes dude. sense you 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 want to enjoy when you open up a tub you know what i mean yeah because I, because yeah. the days that you don't feel like cleaning snake shit and you open them up and you see just a snake glowing out there, then at that yeah. point you're like, oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> you know? Absolutely, absolutely. You're like, god damn, I made that thing. Like, oh, you're just like, it just creates so much satisfaction and happiness, and it's because you liked the founding stock that you got, and it's because you're a successful breeding. And it's rewarding. So pick what you want, man. I don't care if it's. Hog Island boas. I don't care what it is. It, it literally, just be uh, Warren Booth is another great example. That guy picked a specific type of snake, a specific 
you know, size of snake that he wants, and he's been very successful with it. And he will, he's very specific about what he works with. And, and I didn't even know that at all until I listened to his podcast. But, you know, he's doing something he loves. He picked a snake that he loves, and he's stayed true to it. So hats off to him. Awesome, man. All right, final question, number 12. Any shout-outs you want to throw out? Oh, yeah. I would say first off to my wife for letting me do all this and for watching my kids right now while I've been doing this podcast. And Same. then uh, – <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're out there screaming right now. But shout outs to her because, you know, it's it takes a lot. I, I'm definitely a different type of person, and I'd say people that have snakes in general, they're they're a little different, man. It yeah. it, it almost becomes like an obsession, and uh, it's a good obsession, but it it takes a lot of patience from your partner, a lot of patience. And then I would say a shout out to Big Mike. He's pretty much was my mentor, man, my my closest friend, and uh, I just am still to this day in awe of the way that guy does business how successful he is actually breeding which is another thing you could talk about actually per pair how successful people are actually getting snakes grabbing and having litters which he has got to be the top i would say um so shout out to big mike um kyle frost uh kenny saito my man and then brad sherman and uh sergio those are pretty much my guys and uh i have a lot of respect for those guys even if it wasn't for the snakes, just the, the type of guys they are. So um, that that's it for me, man. Awesome, man. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. Um, Chaz, let people out there know where they can learn more about you and see your animals. Um. Well, I've I've been working on a little bit of a website, but um, it is a work in progress. It's uh, lowkeyboas.com. You can go there, but pretty much you can email me at chaztech one <laughs> I guarantee I'm the first person not to throw out a Facebook or whatever. But uh, yeah, man, you can email me. Uh, that's on my website. Or you can just find some of my snakes on Morph Market. And uh, I'm just old-fashioned. So that's how to find me. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. We are out. Guys, that was my favorite episode so far. Thanks to Chaz Shillings of Loki Boas for joining us today. Join us next time as we speak with Dr. Brad Bernardini of Breakneck Boa Company. We're going to talk about his work integrating the blood gene into the sharp complex and what it's like to maintain a boa collection while working a demanding job. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Do us a favor. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Until next time, grow them slow.